Now, I'll admit, because I'm not really going to be fooling any of you if I told you any different. When I saw The Undertaker come back Sunday night at Battleground, I geeked out a little bit inside. There's no question. I mean, I'm a huge Taker Mark, always have been, always will be. I respect him more than any wrestler in the history of the professional wrestling business. Da, 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 da. And I especially got a little bit of pleasure out of watching him be don't give the fucks Taker and beat the hell out of Brock Lesnar. I'm like, yeah, that's right. He broke your streak. Fuck his square-headed sandwich salesman, ugly wife, have an ass, stomping around, suplex, shitty bitch. No, tombstone straight to hell, bitch. Rust in peace. That's damn right. So here's that part of me that was all like, you know, hey, I've enjoyed this. Now, granted, I have said before that I don't really want to see Undertaker ever wrestle again. Because once he lost the streak of WrestleMania 30, I was like, what's the point? I don't really want to see him anymore. It's, it's done. I'm kind of over it. But I have to say that Undertaker versus Brock Lesnar, you know, at a time where the company does so many things that really don't make a lot of sense and they lack um, any real storyline purpose for happening, you know, Brock Lesnar or Undertaker makes sense, especially from a storyline standpoint if you want to look at it this way. Brock's the one that ended the streak at WrestleMania 30. That was the thing that Taker kept coming back for every year. It was the one time of year he came back. So obviously, from a character standpoint, it's going to mean the world to him. It's the most important thing to him. Brock Lesnar took the thing from him that meant the most to him as a character. Combining that with the fact that Lesnar and Heyman were bragging about it, boasting about it, talking about it, and been living off of the reputation of doing it for the past almost year and a half, you know, a guy like Taker eventually, you would imagine, just like anybody else in the real world, would eventually get tired of that, and they get pissed off. And it kind of pushed him over the edge at some point in time. So the reaction of Taker, even with as long as it took for that reaction to happen, does make sense. The guy not only took his streak that was two plus decades in the making that meant so much to his character. Taker got tired of hearing about it, getting rubbed in his face time after time after time. It makes sense. You know, and you've got the Kane element. Yeah, they haven't went there yet. They might not, but they could. You know, you're talking about what Lester did to Kane, who is still Undertaker's brother in storyline sense. There are a lot of elements here that really work that sit there and say, make you say, hey, Brock Lesnar versus Undertaker is a match that is perfectly timed right now. Especially because this is the main event that SummerSlam needed so desperately badly. At SummerSlam, I was looking at this show a couple months ago, and I'm like, they don't have a main event for the show. Especially if they're doing Lesnar and Rollins at Battleground. I don't imagine they'd go back to it again at SummerSlam. And nor would it feel like a main event if they did so. This was the match, the type of match that SummerSlam needed. Especially when you figure that so many people associate Taker with WrestleMania for many, many different reasons. But in part over the past few years, it was because the only time he'd be around would really be WrestleMania season. And with WrestleMania 31, the only time he bothered to come around was WrestleMania 31 itself. Now something means enough, is significant enough, and important enough for Taker at this stage of his career to come back to where he's willing to work a SummerSlam. It will be his first SummerSlam match since Edge in 2008. That's seven years. So that from a storyline standpoint, again, that makes it mean something. That elevates the profile and the importance of this. He felt as a character so strongly about it, and it was so important that he's coming back at a time that you would normally never see Taker. You'd just be coming down the time until you saw him next year come WrestleMania season or WrestleMania itself. So instantly, anybody who is wrestling at, Rus at SummerSlam feels like a big deal. This becomes the special attraction. And when you look at Brock Lesnar, the definition of special attraction in today's WWE, when you do bring him around, you want to put him in spots that matter. You want to put him in matches of significance. Well, title or not, it doesn't get much more significant than Brock Lesnar versus The Undertaker at a big four pay-per-view like SummerSlam. So you've got Brock Lesnar in that mega fight spot as that marquee attraction along with Taker. You're getting that maximum return on the Brock Lesnar investment by putting him in this spot at SummerSlam, so it makes sense. And also when you look at the WWE perhaps trying to build this up as their summer version of WrestleMania, which they should have always been doing to begin with, you need these type of matches, especially since SummerSlam has always seemed to enjoy and love those special attraction type of SummerSlam matches that aren't for the titles, their personal feuds, I'll go back to maybe Triple H versus Shawn Michaels at SummerSlam 2002. You know, people will bring up Brock Lesnar versus The Rock. But honestly, that's not the first match you think about. 
You don't think about that shit. You know, I go back to SummerSlam 2005. People will think about Hulk Hogan versus Shawn Michaels. You know, throughout the history of SummerSlam, there are those special attraction matches like that. Like 2008, you know, John Cena versus Batista. I mean, those were big special attraction matches, honestly. And SummerSlam seems to love those. It's a perfect place to have them. So having Brock Lesnar versus The Undertaker at SummerSlam in a revenge match, in the rubber match or grudge match, whatever you want to call it, makes a world of sense. Now that I got all the positives out of the way, let me, let me put it to you this way. I think this is dumb in a lot of ways. And I think this is ultimately, you know, a representation of a lot of things with WWE. Uh, it, it represents their identity crisis and the fact that they don't know what the hell they want to do, what direction they want to go in. And I think it's ultimately a knee-jerk kind of panic re reflex reaction. And really is a lose-lose situation for all parties involved. I look at this from the Undertaker character standpoint. You know, yeah, like I said, it can make a lot of sense about why he would come after Brock Lesnar the way he did. But did you really need to wait that long? Why wouldn't you come back at him at SummerSlam 2014? Maybe cost him the title against Cena. You know, he's going after Cena in the title. He's dominating Cena. Why wouldn't an Undertaker step in and take that from Brock Lesnar? Because that would mean much to Lester's character like the streak did to Taker's character. Either way, why would we wait a year and a half now to where we've even seen Taker wrestle somebody else at WrestleMania to now all of a sudden he's so pissed off he has to go after Brock Lesnar? That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I don't think this makes a whole lot of sense from a business standpoint too, and hear me out. You know, Taker's at this stage of his career where he only got a certain amount of matches left in that body. And for the past few years, he's really, for all intents and purposes, only worked one major match a year, and that's at WrestleMania. And that's for a reason. Because that's where you're going to get the biggest bang for your buck out of Taker working a match. It's going to be WrestleMania. It's your most important show of the year, your biggest show of the year, which he's been such a big key part of for so many years. A special attraction, maybe in a lot of cases, the attraction of that show. He didn't want to put it at risk or at jeopardy by work overworking him any other time. You needed him most for WrestleMania. That's the time you brought him in. Why would you sit there and potentially put WrestleMania 32 in jeopardy for The Undertaker, knowing that you're going to try and set an indoor attendance record drawing 110 plus thousand people at AT&T Stadium by having them work a SummerSlam match here? That just doesn't make a lot of sense. While, yes, SummerSlam needed this special attraction type of main event in a very, very bad way, at the end of the day, where are you going to get your bigger return out of Taker wrestling a Lesnar or anybody else? It's going to be WrestleMania. If I've only got one match a year out of Taker potentially, I'd rather wait till WrestleMania than put it at risk by having him wrestle at SummerSlam. Because what happens if Taker suffers a serious injury in that match against Lesnar where he has to be on the shelf for nine months to a year? Then he's out for that next year's WrestleMania. That's one less potential major drawing card for that event that is going to be of such critical importance to the WWE. You're putting that at risk, you're putting that in jeopardy for SummerSlam. I think that's stupid. I really, really do. And then when we look at this from a creative standpoint, in terms of how you book the match, the streak is over. Brock took the streak. Whether I like it or not, or a lot of you like it or not, it's happened, it's done. You can't change it no matter what. And part of the whole rationale and reasoning we were given is that it was so they could get the return on that investment long term. It was Taker wanting to give back to the business. It was that way so Brock Lesnar could put other people over. Does that really make any fucking sense if Taker comes back just to beat Brock Lesnar? If he wins, then why the fuck did you end the streak? You ended the streak with Brock Lesnar winning just so that way he could put over the fucking Undertaker. Well, if he was going to put over the fucking Undertaker anyways, why not just have him do it at WrestleMania 30? The purpose of Brock Lesnar taking the streak and running with it was at some point in time he can help build up your next generation. How in the fuck is he building up the next generation if the first person he's jobbing out to is the fucking Undertaker? He's decimated Cena. Rollins didn't beat him. Roman Reigns didn't beat him. But now here comes Taker, who struggled to beat Bray Wyatt who was decimated by Lesnar the year before, and now he's the guy that's going to beat him. He's going to get the revenge. And while that sounds good in theory, if he wins, why the fuck did you end the streak? What the fuck was the point? And then on the flip side, from a taker standpoint, if he loses, why bother with this at all? It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. 
and it doesn't really make a lot of sense for the character. Why have him come back on this revenge shit? Why have him sit there and be booked this strong and be made to look this imposing and this much of a fearful presence just to sit there and have him lose? Brock Lesnar already beat him once. Why the fuck would Brock Lesnar be, need to beat him a second time? So whether Taker wins or Taker loses, I don't really think it helps anybody, and it just doesn't make a whole lot of fucking sense. And then from Brock Lesnar's standpoint as a character, you've taken by far your top babyface, your most interesting character that you have, and now turned him heel for, for this feud. Now, certainly, not everybody's going to boo Brock Lesnar. A lot of people probably won't boo, boo Brock Lesnar. But at the end of the day... Taker wins out. I don't give a fuck what any Lesnar fan's going to say. Taker wins out at the end of the day. Taker is going to be the babyface no matter how much heel shit he does. Taker's the guy that the fans are going to side with. Taker's the guy that people are going to say, yeah, he should be pissed. This guy ended his fucking streak and then rubbed his fucking face in it. That's Taker. I grew up on this dude. Fuck Lesnar. So now you've basically taken Brock Lesnar and turned him heel without doing any heel shit whatsoever. Without doing anything that really makes him a villain. You can sit there and say, well, he talked, did, 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 No. Now, what you've also done is after a while, you're fighting it. You finally went with it and understood that, especially once he creamed Cena. He was the top baby face in your company, as I said back then, last August. Now you're basically reminding the fans why they're supposed to hate Lester, and now you're confusing the fucking audience, and now people don't know what the fuck to think. You can't just turn this shit on and off instantly like that, especially if Lesnar doesn't give you anything to really sit there and say, now I should boo him, and then now I should cheer him. Fans are going to be reminded, oh yeah, I love Taker more. He ended Taker's streak. That pissed me off. Fuck you. And then you're supposed to go right back to it afterwards, and it's like, yay, Lesnar. It just doesn't make any sense. And then again, from the Brock Lesnar standpoint, seeing as how nobody has beaten him clean since WrestleMania 30, what does beating Taker do for him? He's already beat Taker once. Now he beats Taker not at a WrestleMania? Plenty of other people have beaten Taker not at WrestleMania. It doesn't mean the same. And frankly, it doesn't mean very much at all. But losing to Taker would be completely ridiculous. Again, I will go back to if you have Taker win, why did you end the streak? If you have Taker come back to wrestle Lesnar just for wrestler to lose to Taker, then why the fuck did you end the streak to begin with? You made the decision, then fucking go with it. It's that simple. To sit there and say, whoa, we gotta have Taker go back over, then what the fuck was the point of Lesnar beating him to begin with? Just so that way he could put over the fucking Undertaker? Again, as I referenced a few minutes ago. If he was just gonna do that, then he should have just had him lose at WrestleMania 30. It's stupid. And again, it just really creates, as I think I've illustrated here somewhat, a lose-lose situation for all parties involved. And this is ultimately what this shows to me. Is that SummerSlam didn't have a main event, and it didn't. So WWE being in their kind of semi-panic mode, and with their failure to create new compelling stars that people actually want to pay money to see and be bothered to see, the WWE did what they so often did. They have to continue living off of the moments of the past in order to create moments in the now, and then went back! To the future! To bring back another part-time guy in order to main event one of their big shows. Because they can't figure out a way to put a compelling, interesting card together at a major show without doing so. That's what they continue to do. And even with that being said, it shows you that the WWE is going to get a diminishing return on this. You can only do this so many times where this is going to have an appeal or a positive effect, where at some point in time people are going to be like, all right, I'm tired of seeing this shit. I watched those guys all that many years ago. There's no more nostalgia pop there. You've done it too many times. I don't want to see this shit either. And then what the fuck do you do? It's basically illustrating a lack of confidence in the non-John Cena WWE roster. Because you have no desire and no ability and no wherewithal to be able to create any new stars. And as a result, because of the bad things you've done, it creates a situation where you head into a big show like this, you don't really have anybody on your full-time active roster that you could put in a SummerSlam main event and carry the show. That creates a panic. And again, the only thing you do is live off of past performance and reputation and names. And that's what the WWE does with so many of their big shows now, because they don't have a choice. But this also shows me is that once and for all, it confirms that the only reason Vince McMahon ended the streak was because he wanted something shocking 
for the first ever special event pay-per-view on the WWE Network, which is the completely wrong dumb dick reason to end the streak on so many different levels. It speaks again to the whole thing of you do it and then you try to come up with a justification afterwards instead of creating the justification beforehand by having a long, well-thought-out plan. And some of you might sit there and say, well, you had a long, well-thought-out plan. They had Taker end the streak so that way the next time he wrestled, the next couple of times he wrestled, he wrestled John Cena. So that way, instead of this guy being the monster heel that would eventually put over a new monster baby face, he sat there and became the monster baby face. And then he didn't end up putting over Roman Reigns. And he didn't end up putting over Seth Rollins. And now he's getting ready to face a fucking Undertaker to where if he loses to Taker, then again it begs the question, why the fuck did you end the streak to begin with? Because now you're putting over the guy that had the streak to begin with. This is some circuitous dumb shit if I've ever fucking seen it. This also lets you know, too, that WrestleMania 32 is pretty much what I've said before it's going to be. It's going to be an all-in legend fest. And basically, if you're not one of those guys, or you're not a Cena or an Orton or somebody Triple H like that, you ain't getting a featured match on that WrestleMania 32 card. You don't fucking matter. This is going to be all-in. It's all going to be hot-shotting shit. It's going to be all about the past. It's going to be all about living off of shit that happened 10, 15, 20 plus fucking years ago. Because that's the only option the WWE has. And the sad thing is, is this is the best you can get out of the WWE now. Even the stuff that somewhat makes sense still doesn't seem good for so many reasons. And it's because the WWE creates these situations. In a lot of ways, this is a reflection of the John Cena problem and the John Cena monster that has dominated the WWE for the past decade, in part because the WWE allows it to happen and they allow it to manifest and they make it happen. When you blow through so much of the other roster for the expense of one guy, when you don't have that guy positioned in the main event, then what the fuck else do you have? People don't care about anybody fucking else. And that's exactly the problem with the WWE today. Or even if they do give a shit about this guy or that guy, eventually they're just going to run up against the Cena monster or the Lesnar monster, and then they're fucked. If your guys are always getting creamed by certain guys, they never get to that certain part. At some point in time, you become disenfranchised. At some point in time, you become bitter. At some point in time, you become disappointed. And at some point in time, you just don't give a fuck. And honestly, in a lot of ways, that's where I am with Brock Lesnar versus The Undertaker at SummerSlam. Because I just don't see where the benefit is in this. I don't see where a whole lot of good comes out of this. And who's to stay from a in-ring standpoint that this is even going to be any good? Because if we go off of what happened at WrestleMania 30? That's what you decided to make the main event of one of your four biggest shows of the year is Brock Lesnar versus The Undertaker. Oof. Certainly it'll probably be better than that match. And it wouldn't be hard to do that. But again, if Taker wins, what's the point? If Lesnar loses, what's the point? If Lesnar wins, what was the point? If Taker loses, what the fuck was the point? It's going to feel like a lose-lose situation and really, frankly, a waste of time. Which perfectly fits today's WWE.